Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please raise the like button's office chair all the way up and then break off the handle. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In China, there are hundreds of these protected areas where Siberian tigers are raised. And in some of these areas, parks have been created so locals and tourists can visit the animals. One of these parks is the Battling Wildlife World Animal Park, which in addition to allowing its guests to come and look at the animals, they actually allow their guests to hop in their personal cars and drive all around the tiger enclosure completely unsupervised. Despite the almost non-existent security, the park does have one hard and fast rule, and that is at no point during the drive through tour should anyone ever get out of their car or roll their window down. In the summer of 2016, a husband, a wife, their young daughter, and the girl's grandmother decided to go to Battling Park. After paying for an unguided tour, they opened the gates and the family rolled into the tiger enclosure inside of their white sedan. Everyone seemed to be having a great time until the wife in the front passenger seat claimed she was carsick. And so the husband slowed the car down to a complete stop and then the wife promptly got out of the car. What happens in the next 30 seconds is captured in one of the park's security cameras that was trained right down at the front of the car. After getting out, the woman shuts her door and walks around the front of the car until she's right in front of the driver's side door. She leans in to talk to her husband. And as soon as she does, a Siberian tiger comes running out of the forest off camera, lunges towards the car, grabs onto her, and pulls her off camera back into the forest. The husband, immediately leaps out of the car and he hesitates for a second because the grandmother has now opened the back door and she's jumped out as well. And so once they're both on the pavement, they shut their doors behind them and the two of them run off into the forest. Off camera, a gruesome scene would unfold. As soon as the husband and grandmother ran off into the woods, a second Siberian tiger that might have been drawn to the scene from the commotion or the smell of blood immediately leapt out and latched onto the grandmother, killing her instantly. The wife would survive the attack, but would suffer very serious injuries. As for the husband, he would escape with minor injuries, and the child who stayed in the car was totally unharmed. Following the high-profile attack, the battling park was forced to put up more signage on either end of this driving tour to make it very clear to anybody going through that they had to stay in their car with the windows up the entire time. Saying that she wasn't properly warned about the dangers of this park, the woman who survived the attack, the wife who was dragged off initially, she sued the park for two million US dollars. In the wake of the accident, she claims a culture of rampant victim blaming has ruined her life. She's quoted as saying, people's words were perhaps scarier than the mouth of a tiger. 63-year-old Kurt Kayser was a farmer who had a knack for finding clever ways to keep his machinery up and running on his 1,500-acre hog farm in Nebraska. In the winter of 2019, when the ground was frozen solid, Kurt was having a hard time putting his fill bin underneath his grain auger, and so he did what he did best. He improvised. A grain auger is this large rotating metal screw that transports grain from one place to another. And so the way this works is imagine this big tube where in the middle of it is this big rotating metal screw. And so the grain gets sucked in on one side, it rotates its way all the way through to the other end of the auger and it spit out the other. And because the auger is basically a giant rotating blade and the entry point is actually exposed, there's this big safety grate that's on the outside to make sure the only things getting sucked into the auger are really small, things like grain. Kurt realized if he removed the safety screen, he could easily fit the fill bin underneath. And so he did that and he told himself that he would just replace the safety screen as soon as he was done. But it turned out once that safety screen was gone, the machine actually worked a lot better. And after a couple of days of operating the auger without the screen, he just kind of forgot about it. Fast forward a few months to April 19th, 2019, and Kurt needed to move some grain from one bin to another. 
And so he fired up the auger that still did not have the safety screen on the outside of it. And as he was walking right near the entrance to the auger, he tripped and he fell feet first into the opening of the auger. And right away, his left foot got sucked up into the rotating metal screw. And before he'd even fallen back onto the ground, he could tell his left foot had been cut clean off. But that wasn't the worst of it because the rest of his leg was still getting pulled into the shaft. That screw was gonna keep on turning and he could not get to the turn off switch. And so he immediately starts fumbling for his phone and he realizes he doesn't have it on him. He left it in the shed. And so he's got no way to call anyone. There's no one anywhere near him. No one's gonna hear him scream. And so Kurt's looking around wondering what he's gonna do as he can feel himself being pulled closer and closer to the machine. But in that moment, the adrenaline was so high for Kurt that he felt no pain. He only had one thought, survive. Kurt realized he had his pocket knife. He always carried it with him. He pulled it out, it was a four inch blade, and he realized he could cut his leg off, but he had to time it right. If he didn't cut through fast enough, the auger would rotate all the way around and would pull more of his leg, the area he was cutting, into the auger. So we'd have to start all over again. And so he watched the rotating screw until he could clearly see a break in his leg and he timed it so he reached down and cut through his leg as fast as he could right before the rotation of the auger caught up again. And as soon as he cut through, he fell backwards, rolled onto his stomach and began army crawling all the way 200 meters back to his shed where he pulled himself up inside, he got his phone and he called his son and he very calmly told him that he had his leg cut off in the auger. Kurt was soon airlifted to a hospital where doctors were able Able to perform a real amputation on him. For a little while after his accident, Kurt was a celebrity. He was all over the news, but apparently he just did not care at all about that. All he wanted to do was put a prosthetic on and go back to work. And sure enough, only a few weeks after having his leg ripped off by an auger, he was back out working on an auger with a prosthetic leg. On September 29th, 2015, a tropical storm named Joaquin was swirling off in the Atlantic and forecasters were having a hard time determining how big it was gonna be, how fast it was gonna be, and where it was gonna end up. On shore, 53-year-old captain Michael Davidson was struggling too. He was supposed to pilot his enormous cargo ship, the El Faro, from where he was in Florida all the way out to Puerto Rico, a 2,600 mile journey that would put he and the rest of his 32 person crew directly in the path of the storm. The year before, Davidson had been passed over for a promotion for a younger, more tech-savvy captain. And so now, Davidson felt like he had something to prove. As he looked out over the calm water and the clear sky, he made a fateful decision. Every agency out there was telling him to not set sail until the storm had passed. But with 37 years of experience, Davidson felt differently. He felt like he could outrun this storm. Feeling suddenly motivated and confident, Davidson boarded the El Faro, hopped on the intercom, and informed his crew that they would not be waiting out the storm. Instead, they would be sailing right by it. As El Faro cast off her lines and headed southward, the governors of New Jersey, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Maryland all declared states of emergency. As the sound of El Faro's diesel engine faded over the horizon, cyclone warnings and hurricane warnings went up around the Bahamas. Schools on the islands began closing, flights were grounded, and cruise ships were diverted. Residents of one island were ordered to evacuate, and on another, police forcibly removed every occupant on this island as floodwater rose. But the first few hours of El Faro's journey were totally uneventful. But as they got closer and closer to the storm, the wind picked up and the waves grew dramatically. By nightfall, the ship was rocking so aggressively side to side that it made sleep almost impossible. By the following morning, the rain was so intense, the visibility was basically zero, and the waves were now so massive that none of the crew dared go out on the deck in fear of being swept overboard. The ship's navigator told Captain Davidson that he thought the storm was a lot worse than they were expecting and that they should really consider turning around before it was too late. Davidson and the navigator were not the only ones up on the bridge, which is where the ship is actually steered from. There was also a black box that was anchored up on the wall behind them that recorded all of the conversations that happened up there. And the black box would record increasingly anxious conversations between the crew and Davidson as they voiced their concerns about the storm. But Davidson was totally unfazed. 
raised. He was adamant that the storm was not going to get any worse than what they were seeing right then and there. And even if it did get worse, they were never going to be actually in the storm's eye, and so they weren't in any real danger. But to reassure his crew, he ordered his navigator to make a slight right so everybody on board saw they were taking a wider berth around the storm. One of the crew members, a 34-year-old woman named Danielle Randolph, was not reassured by this slight right. She was a hard worker from a military family and always followed orders, but she just could not understand why Davidson was not taking the storm seriously. And so that evening, after the sun had set, Danielle very carefully stumbled her way up the stairs to the navigational bridge because the ship is still rocking violently side to side. And when she got up there, she thought she would just check the weather for herself. The black box anchored to the wall recorded her discovery. The El Faro was not going to sidestep the storm. It was sailing directly into it. You can hear the fear and surprise as Danielle turns to Davidson and says, we're sailing right through the eye. There was a silence on the recording as Davidson must have looked down at the computer screen that Danielle had pulled up to show him the storm and their course that was going right into it. And Davidson, after he realized his mistake, has this very eerily calm tone where he says to the navigator, okay, I need you to make another slight right. And he assured everybody on the bridge that that would be enough, that that would fix this mistake. But Danielle was not buying it. And so as professionally and respectfully as she could, she says to her captain, this is a really bad idea. We really need to turn around right now. It's getting to the point where it's gonna to be too late and we won't be able to turn around. But Davidson wasn't having it. And so he told Danielle and the navigator and the other people in the bridge that they were not in danger, that everything's just fine. This is just like the storms he had been through when he used to work in Alaska and they would get through this one too. Davidson was so confident in his decision-making that he told them he was gonna go take a nap downstairs and if they really needed him, if something serious happened, go and get him. And with that, he left the bridge and went down to his room. As the minutes of the night ticked by, Danielle stayed up in the bridge and she braced herself against a steel girder and looked out the window at the rain that was just slashing across the window and the waves that were the size of three-story houses crashing in on either side of them. And then by the morning, when the sun came up, the sky just stayed totally black because they were right outside the eye of the storm. Suddenly, under their feet, Danielle and the navigator and the other people up on the bridge heard this awful clanging metal sound as the constant rocking of the ship had finally loosened up the straps holding down these massive metal containers down in the cargo hold and they were now loose smashing into the inside of the ship and then they heard an even worse sound and the black box recorded it too and that was the shrill of an alarm that meant El Faro was taking on water. Danielle left the window and ran around to the radar screen to see if there was any ships in the area that might be able to help them but when she looked there was no blips on the screen all the other ships had diverted to avoid the storm. El Faro was totally alone. At the sound of the alarm, Davidson came running back up to the bridge and you hear him on the black box and he sounds like someone who's acting calm, but there's a tightness in his voice that he's trying to conceal the fact that he's actually probably quite scared. Because at this point, the reality was the El Faro was now too close to the eye of the storm and they would be unable to escape its grasp. They were gonna get pulled into the eye of this hurricane. Furious with her captain, she brushed past him without saying anything and then very carefully made her way down the stairs to her room. And the whole time she was walking, she would have been barely able to stand because now with those loose shipping containers down in the cargo hold, the ship would rock even farther to each side because as soon as it tilted one way, the containers would slam into the wall, driving it even farther into the water. When she finally staggered her way down and got to her door, she would have opened it up and her whole room would have been trashed. Everything that wasn't anchored down had been tossed all over the room, all of her clothes, any furniture would have been dumped all over the room. But she didn't care about any of her stuff on the ground. She only wanted her laptop. She found it, it was on the ground. She picked it up, she put it on her desk that was bolted down and very carefully she opened it up and she opened her email. As the alarms are shrieking in the background and she can hear the sound of these shipping containers smashing into the inside of the cargo hold, she writes this note to her mother where she tells her the winds are really bad and it looks like they're sailing right for the center of the storm. And she's about to hit send when she stops for a second. She looks at her computer screen and she adds one more line, love to everyone. Danielle never said things like this. She was always strictly business. And so for her to put that line was an acknowledgement that this might be the last time she ever talks to her family. Shortly after Danielle hit send on that email, the ship listed hard to one side and then it stayed there. 
the loose containers down in the cargo hold had finally shifted the ship's center of gravity. Water immediately began pouring into the lower sections of Alfaro. Danielle knew it was only a matter of time before the water reached her, and so she leapt out of her room and ran down the hall, which was now sideways. She got to the stairwell and climbed her way up to the bridge. As soon as she got up there, all the people on the bridge were holding onto the center console so they didn't fall up against the wall, and she heard Davidson ordering the navigator to turn the ship into the wind. It was a last-ditch Hail Mary effort where Davidson believed the wind was so strong it would blow the ship back upright. If this didn't work, the ship was going to sink. And so the navigator began desperately turning the wheel, the lights inside of the bridge began to flicker, and the engines growled and vibrated as it churned, trying desperately to get up and over this enormous wave. But as they were just about to crest the top, the engines completely died and it went silent in the bridge. And so now that Alfaro is without power, it's just sitting idle in the middle of the storm and it's getting smashed by these three-story high waves and it begins to force the nose of this giant ship to go under and stay under. Davidson breaks the silence by hitting the emergency beacon that notifies the Coast Guard and then he screams to everybody on the bridge to go downstairs and wake everyone up. We have to get off this ship. On the black box, a new sound is heard, the abandoned ship alarm. At this point, the black box faint picks up Davidson screaming from somewhere outside of the bridge for people to get in the rafts, get off the boat, get in the water. By this point, the back of the Alfaro would have been off the water and the nose would have been almost pointed straight down. And so Davidson is heard coming back up into the bridge, but at this point, the bridge is sideways. It's looking straight down at the water. And it's clear there is another crew member that is stuck inside of the bridge and he's yelling out to Davidson, Cap, Cap, you gotta help me. And Davidson is trying to find him and he's yelling for him to come to him, come to him. And the man tells him he's stuck. He can't go anywhere. He's a goner. And Davidson, with the final words uttered on this black box, would yell to this man, I'm not leaving you. It's time to come this way. And then the black box would cut out because the black box was now underwater. For three days, searchers could not even get close to the Alfaro wreckage because of the storm. But when they did finally get there, all they could find were three life rings, two life rafts, and the starboard lifeboat that had been crushed on both sides. A Coast Guard helicopter found a body floating around some of this wreckage, but when they went down to retrieve it, it slipped under the water. Five days after Alfaro's last frantic plea for help, the Coast Guard declared the ship had sunk and everyone on board had died. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please raise the like button's office chair all the way to the top and then break off the handle. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I post short videos. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.